really not to um, not to speak if I speak I am in in big trouble in big trouble a mission impossible dead reckoning part one sends Ethan hunt on the hunt for his most dangerous enemy wait didn't I do this already oh yeah Right, so like I said in my positive video, Dead Reckoning is amazing, one of my favorite movies of the year. But at the same time, for me at least, it's also one of the most frustrating movies of the year. Not to mention a bit of a flop that lost a bunch of money. Oops. And as promised, today I will focus exclusively on that to uncover why it is. And listen, a lot of what I'll be talking about today will be heavily opinionated and possibly all wrong. You guys, my audience, you know more than me, you decide, that's what this channel is based on. I try to take lessons from movies and then you guys decide whether I'm onto something or not. No, no, no. Es la mía cliente. La mía cliente. Grande. No. And in fact, I've heard a lot of people loving this movie and saying it's the best in the series. If you think so, great. I'm sure you're right. But still, if you come to me to say that, that The Dead Reckoning is better than Fallout, you know. I don't accept that. I loved Fallout. That for me was the best action movie since Terminator 2, which is saying a lot. And this, I thought, was a major step down. The weaknesses from before have grown, while the strengths from before have shrunk. And it was very frustrating and disappointing to see, because I know that these filmmakers are some of the best in the business and that they can do way better. A lot of that disappointment is my own fault for setting my expectations unrealistically high, sure. But I also feel like the filmmakers here turned into Icarus after all their success, and as a result, committed a bunch of unnecessary mistakes that I just don't agree with. So today, let's go through those mistakes, the things about the directing that I disliked and the reasons why. Not to trash the movie because I like it, but more so to evaluate it with the power of hindsight in the hopes that maybe things will be even better in the future. Freak accident gave him the amazing power of extraordinary hindsight. Captain Hindsight! The first thing here I really don't like is the MacGuffin key. And look, I'm a writer. I used to love MacGuffins because they can turn the plot into a tangible, simplified, easily comprehensible and followable form. Oh, that's very clever. I just feel like after Infinity War, Hollywood ruined them. Now everybody's motivation is driven by some whatever random item. And Dead Reckoning is no different. Whatever the completed key unlocks, I will find it. Okay. Oh, there's a key, and it's actually two keys, and nobody knows what it unlocks, but whatever, we gotta get the key. This guy has the key, follow the key, where's the key? The reason I don't like the key is because it's an empty arbitrary item that in of itself has no function or value. It's just a thing people look for and carry around. You know, R2-D2 in A New Hope is a MacGuffin, but he's a character. The message he carries is about Leia, a character. Davy Jones' heart mm -hmm. is his heart. The Infinity Stones weren't just stones. They each had specific power and meaning like sacrifice attached to them. Even the plutonium in Fallout had value in terms of the destruction it poses, the people it is dependent on and originates from, in terms of its function at the end. Whereas here, it's just a f key that's just kinda there. It could have been anything, could have been a jar of piss. Oh, Ethan, this jar of piss contains the special cooling liquid that controls the AI. We gotta find it. But first, we, we gotta go get the special lid opener that can open the jar of piss. It could be that, and literally nothing about the story or characters would change. And to simplify this point with a MacGuffin of my own that I see every day, look at this, my desktop browser, Opera. Look closely. What you're seeing are things Opera uses to simplify to people why they should pay attention. Oh, we have this button that lets you control artificial intelligence. Well, if it's just a button there that's nothing but a button, so what? What are you doing? Me? 
It's hanging around. But no, it has value and function on its own then and there. You click it and it opens up an AI called Aria. You can ask Aria anything and it immediately scours the internet to bring you a quick answer without you having to click away to find it. It is super useful. It's a thing that's more than just a thing, right? Theory will take you only so far. Same with Upper's Tab Islands. Oh, what if you could neatly organize your tabs into groups and then collapse and expand them when needed? Well, you can, it works. Oh, what if you could have a built-in ad blocker? Well, there it is, one click away. You know, when Opera touts itself as faster and better and more convenient than all other basic browsers, I still feel like I gotta do more, all right? Let's go. There's value in that. These are MacGuffins with functions of their own. And you can get all of it for yourself by downloading Opera for free with the link below. A mission you should accept. As in, yeah, this this was an ad. Got <laughs> I'm gonna catch heat for this video anyway, so I might as well. But hopefully my MacGuffin example about these MacGuffins had value by helping you better understand good MacGuffins. Another more obvious tip down here is the lack of incredible set piece stunts that this franchise has become famous for. And when I say lack, I mean that there's basically just one. Ethan jumping a motorcycle off a cliff with a parachute. It is very dangerous and cool, yes, but it's alone. You know, while there is a bunch of amazing action on sets and on locations here, a lot of that has already been done and done for real. This was the one big new real thing they could sell in the marketing. Whereas in Fallout, it was like boom, 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 boom. Multiple bigger and smaller set piece stunts that made your jaw drop. And I just don't think they tried hard enough to find those here. Not to mention that there's only one part to this stunt. Ethan jumps the motorcycle and activates the parachute and that's it, that they cut away. Not gonna lie, based on the hype, I thought there'd be more to it, like chasing the train with the parachute and landing on it GTA style. Especially because I was already forced to see the jump itself multiple times in the marketing. In Fallout, the bigger set piece stunts had many narrative parts to them. Climbing a chopper, taking control of the chopper, chasing another chopper, crashing the choppers to a mountain where they actually then went down the mountain. Here, it's basically just this. That's not good enough! Relating back to the MacGuffin topic, another thing I don't like here is the filmmaker's insistence to go film without a script and just write it up as they go. Like, no wonder the key means nothing when, at this point, not even the people making the movie fully know what it means or will mean. This is why I was also not the biggest fan of Rogue Nation, where they had a literal empty box MacGuffin that they didn't even know the contents of while filming. That's a red box. What? It's a red box. British government uses them to transport state secrets. This is where we finally decided what the red box was, but not what was on it. No. Yeah. This was our way of this getting like, through the scene. <laughs> yes, it's a red box, but we don't know what's on it yet. And at the end, it was just like, oh, it's some money that the villain wants. Whoopie doo. Yes, it's a red box, but we don't know. You're laughing. You're laughing. Look what happened because of what you did, what it led to. I know. And look, I understand that scripts evolve and change when filming, but to go film a movie when you don't yet even know whether the villain is a computer or a human using a computer, that makes no sense. Those are two very inherently different movies, they, they don't just swap over, which explains why the AI is barely in the final product. It's like building a train track ahead of a train. In that rush, you're bound to make the simplest mistakes. How come Ethan jumps off the cliff and then randomly smashes into the right car to save Grace just when she needs saving? How come Grace has brown eyes when she poses as the widow? Why wouldn't she use contact lenses? Why wouldn't the widow's own brother take note of it when even to the audience it looks weird? Why does Gabriel smuggle himself onto the train in a box when, by all accounts, he could have just walked in like he does everywhere else? How come Gabriel presents this choice of either Ilsa or Grace dying, but then Ethan or anyone else never has to make any kind of choice? Gabriel just fights them both and kills one. 
you know, the movie's just waffling. It's like the filmmakers came up with this idea on a day and then forgot about it the next day. I mean, how is this a choice anyway? I would have told myself, don't think which pe that's yeah, the best of jerk off first, then think about it. Not to be too harsh, but what's clear now is that on Fallout, we got lucky. Nobody is talented enough to make an airtight movie without a proper enough script. Not Michael Bay, not even Cruz and McQuarrie. And I really hope that from this point on, they prepare more. And it came time to shoot the train sequence, and I did not know anything that was happening inside the train. This leads to another letdown, which is the villain side. Like I said, the AI is barely in the movie because originally it wasn't in the movie. It sinks some Soviet battleship at the start and then doesn't do much else. I mean, I guess it does pull some pranks and mischief. This is a bad shit. But mainly, its threat is established with verbal government exposition, which was another later addition in filming. In this movie, I just don't get enough to know why it's so important to go stop the AI. Seems like if you leave it alone, it doesn't do anything. Gained entry to the major defense, finance, and infrastructure systems. And what did it do to all of these systems exactly? Nothing. Nothing? Overall, it's kind of like Dead Man's Chest, but, you know, without Davy Jones or the Kraken actually doing anything. Okay. Then there's the AI's henchman, Gabriel, who I also thought was lackluster. Firstly, because I thought he was horribly miscast. He's supposed to represent a cold, unfeeling machine, yet the guy playing him oozes this warm, elegant, dad-like charisma. I just don't see the fit. The non-speaking jester villain would have been a much better fit, but we'll get to that later. Personally, I just can't see Gabriel as this murderous psychopath no matter how the movie keeps trying to pose him that way. He's a dark messiah and he sees death as a gift he wants to share with the rest of the world. It's not the killing he enjoys, it's the suffering he causes. And it doesn't help that Gabriel as well doesn't do much, aside from standing menacingly in the background and attacking meaningless side characters. He does have some backstory and he does kill Ilsa down the line, yes, but even that I thought was undeserved. You know, for 90 minutes this dude does nothing remarkable and then suddenly he outcombats Ilsa Faust. What? Which is a good reminder that there's really only two proper ways to establish a villain's power level. Either you build it up with increasing actions throughout the movie like August Walker, or you introduce the villain with it like with the wolf beating Puss in Boots in his first scene. But for a villain to mostly operate on level 1, and then from that to suddenly jump to level 10 when the story needs it, I don't see it. Although I will say that it was really smart to make us think that Ilsa died in the beginning so that it was then easier for us to come to terms with it when she actually dies later on, because we've already once had to come to terms with it. That was smart, just more proof that Macquarie is one of the best. I just think that in terms of villains, he tends to write the same one again and again. This mild-mannered, menacing badass whose build-up comes mostly from other people's reactions. And both in here, as well as in Rogue Nation, I believe the power dynamics he uses are wrong. Like, it's pretty easy to pose as a calm badass when you're in control, when you have the goons or the backing of an all-knowing AI. You know, the menacing demeanor isn't really worth anything, everyone could do it in that situation. That's why Solomon Lane for me didn't get good until Fallout, where he was able to be calmly menacing even though he wasn't the one holding the power in the scene. There's more about this in the film Intel book by the way, so go buy it. That's worth something. The Joker is awesome because he can clown around in situations where nobody else would dare clown around. I thought my jokes were bad. And speaking of Ilsa, another problem I have with the Dead Reckoning is its treatment of female characters. Specifically, how most women have basically become motivators for Ethan. If you take Grace, for example, fundamentally, she's great. A great actor doing great work. But her entire role in the movie is basically this. She gets herself in trouble, Ethan comes to save her from trouble, and then she double-crosses him to get him in trouble. Rinse and repeat. <laughs> Again, not to be too harsh, but for me at least, this gets pretty annoying. Grace is annoying because she's mostly a useless, spineless snake, and Ethan is annoying because he doesn't learn from the bites. Oh, 
I can't believe you It's like Grace is his Martha from BVS. He just loses all intelligence at the sight of it. All he can ever think about is saving this pretty brunette he just met. While I do understand that Ethan values the life of others, there's a difference between that and becoming a dumb simp for one person. Are you okay? And who's that? Oh, it's Simp! There's just no way that a spy like this could survive more than 15 minutes. And it's not just Grace, every woman hero is mainly a motivator. Ethan hates Gabriel because Gabriel killed his female partner. Ethan is put in a spot where he has to quote unquote save either Grace or Ilsa. Ethan pushes himself to drive off the cliff because he can't let Grace die like all those other brunettes. That's literally how they cut it. Hey you, get your damn hands off. It's not all bad, but I just think that this movie treats Ethan too much like an idiot and female heroes too much like fragile flowers that need constant attention and rescuing. Is anything broken? Are you okay? Fallout handled it way better. Ethan's altruism was very much present, yet it never became too forced to the point of overshadowing other stuff. I have to go now. Another thing I really don't like here is the exposition, which has been part of Mission Impossible before, but now has grown out of control. After the prologue, we get information about the key and the mission. After the mission, we get information about the AI and the key and mission and whatever else. While I did mention some positive writing tricks about this in the other video, at the end of the day, it's still 12 minutes of people discussing exposition in one room, to a point where it becomes a Q&A session. How do we find this key first? How would you verify that? How do we find its mate? Who is she? Where is she now? And who put up the bounty? Who the hell is this guy? Well, does he have it, Kedrick? What does it stand for? And what do they do exactly? Who's in charge? And this is perhaps my biggest disagreement with writer-director Chris McQuarrie, whose interviews I've listened to more than any other filmmakers. See, his philosophy about the exposition seems to be that it's like a gas payment. It's not fun, but if you get it done here, you can then move on to the good stuff without having to worry about it which I just don't get or agree with. There should be no bad stuff in a movie. The whole movie should be the good stuff. If I pay money for a rental car, I don't then wanna have to immediately stop for gas. I believe that the only right way to handle exposition is the way of Spielberg and Cameron. Make it part of larger entertainment. Make it part of action, make it part of tension, drama, whatever. Just do not stop the movie or the story for it for 12 minutes. That is more difficult to pull off, yes, but worth the effort. If you ask audiences to pay 100% of the ticket price, you can't then give them 80% of good stuff and 20% of boring stuff to get through. That's not the deal. I mean, sometimes characters here explain information even though it makes no sense because both sides already know it. Whereas other times we spend 12 minutes learning exposition, which in the next scene is then immediately repeated. It's unacceptable. And the two halves of this key just might provide the means of controlling this. And the worst crime you can commit is telling the audience something they already know. It it'll take a while for the audience to forgive you. This leads to another problem, which is that dead reckoning is too big for its own good. While time isn't an issue per se, the movie itself is so convoluted and full to the point of crumbling under its own weight. On the plot side, things are way too unnecessarily complicated. There are two parts to the MacGuffin key. There are fakes of the key. There are arms dealers hiring thieves to go steal the key from decoy buyers. There's CIA directors making backdoor deals for the key. There's more CIA directors making backdoor deals with the AI. I mean, it just goes on and on. And it doesn't have to. Literally nobody in the audience thinks the movie is better due to this. Just please streamline it. Same on the character side. There are multiple characters who serve the same essential purpose and thus could have been combined or removed. Like, why is there a henchman for a henchman? Just combine them into one and make the gesture the face of the AI. She fits better anyway. Now you can build one tower of value instead of diluting it to two. Now you have to pay just one actor instead of two. Because honestly, I do think a lot of money was recklessly wasted here. This movie apparently cost a hundred million more than Fallout, and I don't see it. Had the filmmakers been more effective, they would have had a better, cheaper movie that would have even made a profit. This also ties to my issue of this movie being a two-parter, which makes it feel kind of dissatisfying, because at the end of the day, not much was achieved by either side. 
like what? Ethan gets the key that he already had a half of in the beginning, and he learns the name of the thing it goes to, which the audience already knew from the beginning. That's it. Nobody is defeated at the end. Nothing major really changes in the world narratively, especially compared to something like Dead Man's Chest, where Davy Jones's heart was found and delivered to a new owner, which completely upended the power dynamics across the seas. So, we're going after this key. Got it. Jack Sparrow! Oh, and Davy Jones, of course, wouldn't really be in this movie, only in the next one. <laughs> <laughs> For me at least, this conclusion just wasn't enough. Not after Fallout, which concluded not only itself, but also narrative strands from earlier movies. And I know I'm starting to run long and maybe nitpicky as well, so here's just a couple more things that I thought are steps down from Fallout. The emotional side is way less. I mainly found it annoying how emotion was used to motivate Ethan. Not to mention that even Ilsa's death was annoying because it's as if the movie just tossed her away in favor of grace. Way better emotion in Fallout, way more intricate and interesting. The music is also a step down. They took this more classical approach. A big nod to the past. You know, we, we were referencing a lot of classical composers, Sibelius. Which I thought was weird because they already did it in Rogue Nation with good but a bit out of franchise results. And because sometimes the music doesn't even fit the narrative. You know, the hero theme is now this full on army marching band fanfare. <laughs> Which is weird because Ethan is very anti-establishment here. He doesn't march to the tune of any army, so why does this music imply so? Fallout had some of those drums as well, sure, but they fit more narratively and they were used better. That score as a whole was on another level in terms of evoking the emotions it was meant to evoke, like size and urgency in the finale. Ethan, come in. And the visuals as well. This movie does look incredible and the production value is off the charts as you can expect, but there is no extra 100 million visible on screen. In terms of shots that you can compare with Fallout, Dead Reckoning usually doesn't compare. The motor chase shots in Fallout looked better. The foot chase shots in Fallout looked better. The skydiving shots in Fallout looked better. The climax climbing shots in Fallout looked better. The climax hook establishing shots in Fallout looked better. Fallout just looked better. And I just... Well, I mean at this point it's starting to sound like I don't like Dead Reckoning, so let's just stop. Because I do like it. It's, it's one of my favorite movies of the year. And hey, if you think it's the best Mission Impossible yet, better than Fallout, good for you. I'm sure you're right. I just don't accept that.